All right, part of the seven is here at last. By the end of this video, this project will be more than two thirds complete. It's honestly insane that I've made it this far and that would not have been possible without your guys' support, watching these videos and all your awesome comments. And I know I don't say this enough, but seriously, thank you guys. Thank you so much for helping me get this far. Okay, that's enough of the mushy stuff. Let's dive into the cynicism that is the Looney Tunes. Canary Row. A classic Sylvester and Tweety chase cartoon, if for no other reason than this one also introduces the awesomeness that is Granny. This is one of the coolest old ladies in the entire history of animation. And she makes an incredible first impression here. This gag of her stuffing herself inside of Tweety Bird's cage so that she can wallop Sylvester will never not make me laugh. There are so many wonderful gags in here. The one that by far stands out the most is the bowling ball gag. And the ending is no slouch either in terms of an ending that is just sheer meanness. Stooge for a mouse. You would think Sylvester would learn to chew his food by this point, given how many times his food keeps fighting back while inside his mouth. Anyway, this cartoon is unbelievably mean and cruel, as the mouse uses psychological torment to drive a wedge between a cat and a dog who were initially the best of friends. And the violence here gets pretty sadistic as the dog pummels the crap out of Sylvester, to the point that he's driven to the point of unconsciousness. It's pretty funny with well-timed slapstick, but I could also see people saying that this one goes a bit too far. Pop em pop. It's weird that the filmmakers kept bringing Hippity Hopper back. It doesn't seem like you could get a ton of mileage out of having Sylvester fight a kangaroo thinking that he's a giant mouse. This has a few decent moments of slapstick, but there's nothing truly great in here. Except this Taps joke. That was good. Also, Sylvester has a son in this one, who, by the way, is incredibly annoying. That means that he did the... You know, yeah, okay, I'm not going to finish that sentence. Bushy hair. This one seems very similar to Gorilla My Dreams, but somehow with even worse pacing. This one's just kind of there and not really all that funny. However, I do kind of like how Bugs tries to use his usual pretending to be killed shtick to try to get the hunter to feel guilty, only for it to just absolutely not work even a little bit this time. That's the one thing that really worked for me in this one. Caveman Inky. I'm actually kind of surprised to see that Inky somehow made it to the 1950s. I thought he would have been left behind in the 40s, but I guess I was wrong. Anyway, this is his final cartoon, and this one kind of feels more like a hodgepodge of all of Inky's cartoons prior to this one, which is probably an indication that, regardless of his character design, it's probably for the best that he didn't appear in anything else. It's watchable for the most part, it's just not really that engaging. Dog Collared This cartoon teaches the very important lesson that if you show kindness to someone who is way too clingy, they will absolutely become so invasive to the point of becoming a full-blown stalker. That's, that, that's the message I was supposed to take away from this, right? Anyway, this one is the right kind of cruelty and had me laughing consistently throughout. This is yet another one where I have to wonder how I never knew about it beforehand. Rabbit of Seville. This one is hypnotically good. Perfect rhythm, impeccable timing, a virtuoso in tempo, and this cartoon just adds classic gag on top of classic gag, like the shaving bit, the flower gag, and the cartoon just keeps building and building until the random but hilarious ending punchline of Bugs and Elmer getting married. Not much more I can say, it's just a classic for a very good reason. Two's a crowd. This one's got a few solid moments, like this mirror gag, and this bone on a mousetrap gag, but other cartoons would do the same basic premise a lot better. This one just feels like a weaker version of Kit for Cat. Still good and enjoyable, but for a rivalry cartoon, that one is obviously so much better. Here we go. Gotta love how Christopher Columbus gets angry at the king and queen of Spain for believing in the pseudoscience that the earth is flat, but then insists on bringing bugs along on the voyage because rabbits are supposed to be good luck. The funny thing is, I thought this was going to be Bugs being a non-stop troll to Columbus, but it's really not. 
It's mostly just bugs trying to survive on the ship with an overly superstitious crew. And it's actually pretty good. Although the story isn't quite as well developed as it could have been. Also, it is officially canon that Bugs Bunny discovered America. A Fox and a Fix This one's a pretty boring premise that's not executed all that well. The timing's all off, it's not really that funny, and the use of the Fox narration feels really out of place. And even the inclusion of the soft-spoken bulldog who will show up in some of Bob McKimson's cartoons, who is usually pretty funny, just can't elevate this one. Canned Feud This is another one of those cartoons that is kind of controversial, with some finding it hilarious and others finding it way too mean. And I get it. The premise is that Sylvester is locked inside his home for two weeks through no fault of his own, and a mouse with absolutely zero provocation steals the can opener from him so that Sylvester will basically starve to death. And I get it. I get that argument 100%. But I'm sorry, the slapstick and timing in this one is too fantastic for me to ignore. The saw gag is also a great classic gag. And Sylvester's facial expression here after the dynamite explodes in his face is also great. But like I said, I get the arguments from people saying that this one is just too mean-spirited. So I guess take all that for what it's worth. Rabbit Every Monday. An exceptionally underrated and overlooked Bugs cartoon. Every joke is a bullseye. Every single one. It gets a lot of mileage out of this bubblegum joke, far more so than you would think, shows Bugs being in irritation for no reason other than because he wants to, brings back the fantastic audience members blocking the screen gag that I actually don't think has been used in a while, and has one banger of an ending. One that I actually didn't see coming. Frizz Freeling, I know I sometimes give you a hard time, but your great cartoons truly are great. Putty Tat Trouble Here's a fun little twist of the Sylvester and Tweety formula by adding another cat into the mix. I don't know why, but this gag of Tweety running into Sylvester's mouth to avoid the other cat, and he has to reach deep into Sylvester's throat to pull him out, is just such a twisted image that I love it. The only thing that kind of bothers me about this one is this blatant continuity error of the ice in this gag being thin in the middle, but then suddenly becomes ridiculously thick. Even as cartoon logic goes, that's pretty ridiculous. Corn Plastered. Uh, what was this? This one's just so flat and poorly timed and flavorless. The crow is annoying and the farmer is a poor man's Elmer and Yosemite Sam. Even the animation is sloppy. There are several points where the old man is saying something, but his mouth clearly doesn't move at all. I get that even great series will occasionally slip up, but it's so baffling that something that this generic and ill-defined managed to be made during this point in time. Even the ending gag is just a worse version of the ending punchline to Back Alley Uproar and Mouse Mazurka. Bunny Hugged Chuck Jones already made a boxing cartoon with Rabbit Punch, and that one is better than this one. This one does flow a bit better as a narrative, but the original has stronger gags. So yeah, since I think the gags are more important, I think the original one is better. But still, this one's got some really good moments, like this punching bag gag. And I do kind of like how this one emphasizes just how physically weak Bugs is, and that he has to rely on his wits to survive. Sentimental Romeo. This one's a pretty standard Pepe Le Pew cartoon. Not a ton here that really stands out, except for this amazing gag where it turns out that Pepe was hugging and kissing a human man while they were in the tunnel of love. That man's facial expression says it all. Although, that does beg the question, was he in there all by himself? What kind of guy goes into the tunnel of love all by himself? Eh, still a funny moment regardless. A bone for a bone. The Goofy Gophers are such fun characters. They're one of the very few Looney Tunes characters who can produce laughs simply by engaging in casual conversation. And the way that they get so sadistic, even when they're still putting up a polite veneer, creates quite a comedic juxtaposition. It's a crime against humanity that they're not more of a household name. And this hose gag truly is a work of genius. A real fun one. The Fair-Haired Hair. I think it is freaking hilarious that both Bugs and Yosemite Sam somehow mistake a bear pelt for a real-life bear. 
Anyway, this one's enjoyable and funny, if for no other reason than to see Bugs and Sam work together as kind of a married couple, with Sam as the housewife. Also, what kind of judge would order two people to live in the same house? Granted, that still wouldn't be the stupidest ruling that a judge ever made, but still. A Hound for Trouble. This one has kind of a slow start, but it picks up the slack quite a bit in the second half. There's two outstanding moments in here. From Charlie Dog stomping his own grapes for the wine, much to the disgust of the customer, and the really cruel ending gag. It's really good. And, aside from a cameo via reused animation in 1958, this will be Charlie Dog's last official appearance, and the last we see of him, he was left all by himself to protect the Leaning Tower of Pisa from falling. I am just going to assume that he starved to death trying to save an entire town. What a true hero. Early to bed. This one's oddly disjointed to begin with, because it starts off as a series of gags centered around gambling, before it turns into another cartoon with this fantastic cat and dog characters, with their wonderful dynamic and chemistry. When you get down to it, the gambling bug seems like nothing more than a device to explain why the cat would even want to play cards with the dog. But that being said, the punishments are really entertaining, and it is also funny to see just how resigned to his face and dejected the cat looks when he goes to spin the wheel. So yeah, this is obviously not perfect, but the parts it does well are done really great. Rabbit Fire. The first of Chuck Jones's famous hunting trilogy. I'm actually struggling to think of a more iconic Looney Tunes cartoon than this one. You mentioned Looney Tunes to the average layman, this is usually the cartoon they think of, even if they don't know the title of it. And that's not without merit, because this is Chuck Jones' slapstick chaos done to bona fide perfection. All the really clever ways they come up with to mess Daffy's face after being shot by Elmer, the classic duck season, rabbit season joke, and the dynamic between all three of these characters. I especially love how Bugs and Daffy are actually willing to band together for survival at one point, but then they both immediately are more than willing to throw each other under the bus to save their own skins. It's awesome. And of course, the ending punchline is one of the most famous endings in the history of the entire Looney Tunes catalog, and that is saying a lot. If you're like one of the, I don't know, two people that haven't seen this one already, get on this right away. It's fantastic. Room and Bird. A lot of great gags in this one, like this baby it's cold inside joke, this gag of Granny hiding Tweety's birdcage in her... that place, this bizarre gag of a mouse coming out of Sylvester's stomach, and for some reason he thinks that Thomas Jefferson is still the president, even though that literally makes no sense. And I like this dynamic of Sylvester and Tweety and the Bulldog basically needing to work together in order to avoid detection from the hotel manager. This one's not fantastic, but it is a really enjoyable outing. Chow Hound, otherwise known as the No Gravy cartoon. This one is building up to just one single joke, because most of this cartoon is just watching a dog abuse a cat and a mouse for his own gluttonous ends. And you're left wondering, how exactly is this supposed to be funny? And then we get to the ending. One of the simultaneously meanest and yet well-deserved endings that Looney Tunes has done. And it was properly built and set up. Making a cartoon where the entire thing is leading up to a single joke at the end can be risky, but in this case it more than paid off. French Rarebit. So disappointed that there's not a Pepe Le Pew cameo in here. There's not really a ton of standout moments in this one, with the exception of this great bit where Bugs tricks the chefs into dressing like rabbits and using them as the main ingredient in a recipe. This isn't one of Bugs' strongest outings, since I felt like more could have been done with this setup, but it's a decently entertaining bit. The Wearing of the Grin. The perfect cartoon to watch for St. Patrick's Day. This one's not the most slapstick heavy of the bunch. Instead, it seems to be a bit more intent on just letting the mood and atmosphere drive it. Both from the spooky abandoned castle setting, and from the trippy, borderline psychedelic nightmare. And it does a good job at it. And seriously, those green shoes that force you to dance an Irish jig feels like something straight out of a horror story. Leghorn Swoggled. A perfect tool to explain to kids how bartering and the economy works. Anyway, another pretty decently enjoyable Foghorn Leghorn outing with a few laugh-out-loud moments, albeit one that doesn't really stick out in the crowd. 
his hair raising tail. This is a clip show. Again. I'd say about 80 to 85% of this cartoon is just clips taken from other previous bug cartoons. Now, I understand that at the time this came out, there was really no way to watch these cartoons whenever you wanted. So that's why clip shows like this were made. But that doesn't change the fact that now that we can watch these whenever we want, clip shows like this feel particularly pointless. At least the wraparound segment this time around is a little bit more cohesive and makes more sense than in Toy Town Hall, wherein Bugs is recounting his many adventures to his nephew, and at least this one's not trying to trick you into thinking that it's not a clip show. So there is that. It's not like this is a painful experience or anything like that, it's just 100% pointless. Cheese Chasers. Another cruel bit of comedy from Hubie, Birdie, and Claude, while doubling as a remake of Life with Feathers while it's at it. Granted, this cartoon doesn't really offer much of an explanation for why Claude won't eat the mice when compared to its inspiration, but this is still really good, with excellent reactions, timing, and slapstick. And this cartoon works a lot better than some of their previous outings together, because the duo of mice aren't being actively malicious with their torturing here, so it makes what they do to poor Claude a lot more palatable than something like Mouse Wreckers or the Hypochondra Cat. I still think the ending's punchline could have been punchier, because this one feels like it just stops, but this is still a real treat. Love Lorn Leghorn. Miss Prissy goes on the rampage looking for some cu- uh, Okay, I'm way too mature to make a joke like that. Plus, I don't want the demonetization deities to smite me. Anyway, Miss Prissy and the Gossipy Hens fit in with the Foghorn Leghorn cast of characters really well. And I like how the feud between the dog and Foghorn is integrated in this cartoon's plot a lot more successfully than in other previous outings. It's really funny, and I especially like the gag of Prissy literally trying to rip the dog's skin off. It's a bit of low-key cruelty that took me by pleasant surprise. Tweety's SOS. Another enjoyable Sylvester and Tweety outing. I especially love how Sylvester gives up on his chase for a little bit simply because he's too seasick to continue. And Tweety decides to take this opportunity to rub salt into the wound. Literally. That being said, this continuity error of Sylvester grabbing the seasick remedy, and then when it cuts back it's still there, remains one of the most distracting animation goofs I've ever seen. It even bothered me as a kid. This is an awesome cartoon nonetheless. Ballot Box Bunny So Bugs wasn't the least bit interested in politics until it affected him personally. The will of the people is so fickle that they default to whoever offers to give them the most amount of free stuff, and politicians from both sides regardless of how idyllic they are at the start, will engage in subterfuge and dirty tactics in order to win the race. This might actually be the most accurate portrayal of American politics in the history of media. Lots of fantastic gags in here, including the first official instance of the Those Endearing Young Charms gag. And yes, I know this gag was recycled from a private snafu cartoon, but the general public wouldn't have seen it at this time. It exudes meanness throughout, especially in the wonderful ending Russian roulette gag. The slapstick gags are fantastic, and of course, the dynamic between Bugs and Yosemite Sam continues to be consistently compelling. A bear for punishment. I just enjoy the absurdity of this premise, of how Ma and Baby Bear are set to give Pa a good Father's Day, even though he absolutely positively wants nothing to do with it. And I am kind of sad to see these three characters go, because I enjoy watching them a lot, and they had a great dynamic. But they had the courtesy of going out on a good, solid note. Also, I don't know why, but every time Looney Tunes goes for a shaving joke, they always manage to knock it out of the park. So funny. Sleepy Time Possum. It's alright. Kind of tries to go with the same kind of Bob McKimson chaotic cruelty that he likes to implement into his Foghorn Leghorn cartoons, but without the strong characters that are in those cartoons. It's good for a filler cartoon, but it won't leave an impact. Drip Along Daffy. This is impeccable kinetic cartoon energy personified, and is a wonderful western parody to boot. It is filled to the brim with jokes bursting forth at the scenes, and the character interactions are all perfect, whether it be Daffy and Porky or Daffy and Nasty Canasta. I can't single out a single joke because they're all amazing. It's just hilarious and pretty much perfect in every single way. Big Top Bunny. Not fantastic bugs, but it does pretty good for itself. 
Bruno is a despicably enjoyable one-shot antagonist, and the diving gag is an incredible work of cruelty. In fact, Bugs in general just seems more petty than usual this time around, which is always a real blast when it happens. Tweet, tweet, tweety. So, if Tweety was just hatched in this version, then does that mean his mother has to be around there somewhere? Unless she just abandoned him? Wow, I just made myself incredibly sad. I should probably stop thinking too hard about the plots of some of these. Anyway, I just love this tree chopping gag, where Sylvester does something so stupid that even if he had been successful, the end result would have been the same. The prize pest. So, the question I have for this one is, how the heck did Porky manage to win a grand prize from a radio show that he apparently didn't sign up for? And why would Daffy be the grand prize anyway? If anything, he'd be the booby prize. Anyway, it's always fun to watch these two characters go at it, and this is no exception. One thing that I've noticed with Bob McKimson's Daffy cartoons is that he keeps trying to reconcile the more jerkish Daffy characterization from this era, courtesy of Chuck Jones and Frizz Freeling, with his older screwball antics. And I think it's largely because of him that this transformation that the character underwent feels more organic and not at all out of character. Who's Kitten Who? Here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that Hippity Hopper appears in more classic Looney Tunes cartoons than the Tasmanian Devil? Just thought I'd bring that up. Anyway, this one's alright, I suppose. It's got a few cute moments and a few amusing moments, like this paper bag of shame gag. But this suffers from the other issues that I have with the Hippity Hopper cartoons, that they just kind of blend together so much for me. I just don't understand how the character of Hippity Hopper provided enough unique material for them to keep bringing him back. Operation Rabbit. Otherwise known as the one where Wile E. Coyote actually talks and goes up against Bugs Bunny. But even though it seems weird to us now, this was only his second appearance having only appeared once beforehand, so this didn't seem like too big of a leap back then. Anyway, the dynamic between these two is great, with Wiley's characterization being that he's an insufferable genius with a highly inflated sense of ego, and the gags are all great. In particular, this last bit where Bugs uses a tractor to place Wiley and all of his explosives right in the path of an oncoming train. The timing, pacing, and facial expressions of this are all on point. Feed the Kitty, the first appearances of Mark, Anthony, and Pussyfoot, and do they really come swinging out of the gate with this one? Their relationship really is one of the greatest in the Looney Tunes catalog, as Mark Anthony is fiercely protective over the adorable Pussyfoot, and even when the kitten gets in trouble or gets him in trouble, he just can't get angry at him. This cartoon is the perfect combination of hilarious, cute, charming, and even a little bit of tear-jerking, with the surprisingly emotional climax where Mark Anthony thinks that Pussyfoot has been turned into cookies. This is also one of the best Looney Tunes cartoons when it comes to hilarious facial expressions, something that Chuck Jones in particular excelled at, but here it's done with sheer mastery. Although, I have to admit, it's a little bit weird that Mark Anthony himself is a house pet, and yet, when the housewife finds out about Pussyfoot, she tells him that the kitten is his responsibility. How exactly does the human-to-house pet dynamic function in the Looney Tunes universe? All kidding aside, this is a masterpiece of a cartoon, and one that I can never get sick of no matter how many times I watch it. Just perfect. GIF Wrapped Does anyone want to explain to me why this one, despite being a Christmas cartoon, that has an incredibly festive feel to it, was released in February? Maybe there's a behind-the-scenes reason for it, but this just feels so weird to me. Anyway, in today's entry in Pointless Bits of Trivia, this is the first cartoon in which Sylvester and Tweety are both Granny's pets, instead of Sylvester just being a stray who came across them. This one's a real fun one, if for no other reason than we get to see Granny smacking both Sylvester and Spike so hard to get them to drop what they ate no less than five times. Granny's presence in these Sylvester and Tweety cartoons will almost always elevate them for me. Foxy by Proxy I just love how Bugs decides to screw with a bunch of foxhounds for literally no reason other than because he was bored. And then he realizes he may have bitten off a bit more than he could chew. I wish there were a bit more gags in here, mostly because this log gag doesn't really work as well when it's a bunch of nameless dogs, 
as opposed to a single hunter. But this is still a pretty solid cartoon with a weird ending. Don't know if I like it or not, but it's definitely not what I was expecting. Thumb fun. Porky is out for a drive, and Daffy is a hitchhiker. The jokes practically write themselves. It made me laugh pretty consistently. And in particular, this gag of the police officer looking in the trunk was brilliantly set up. 14 Carat Rabbit. What? This opening title card? Immediately cancelled. Anyway, all kidding aside, this is another one that I have a real soft spot for. This is Yosemite Sam at his most pointlessly stupid. As if he had stopped for like half a second, thought through the situation, he probably could have gotten the gold if he'd actually cooperated with Bugs instead of trying to trick him. All he would have needed to do was buy as many carrots for Bugs as he wanted. And the ending elevates this one a great deal, as the slow realization of what he's done hits him like a ton of bricks. Little Bo Pepe. In case you needed further proof that we're not supposed to be rooting for Pepe Le Pew, here he commits the sin of leaving the fort that he thought he was supposed to be defending, just so he could chase some... tail. Anyway, this one's got some great gags, some good facial expressions, and some good one-liners courtesy of Pepe. Kitten the Kitten. Dodsworth is a character that feels like he should be a lot funnier than he actually is. Like, I get that he's supposed to be slow and lazy, but that doesn't mean that he needs to talk so slow. Best I can figure is that he's supposed to be a cat version of W.C. Fields, which... I mean, even though Fields had passed away, like, six years prior, I guess it's possible he was still well-known enough at the time that it would make sense to satirize him. The premise of this one is pretty good, I like the kitten character, and I especially like the big final payoff. It's not hilarious, but it's fine. Water, water, every hair. But not a drop to drink. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anyway, this is the second of two cartoons to feature bugs going up against Gossamer. And just like the first one, it's got an incredible horror and haunted house aesthetic. And the fight between bugs and the monster is actually briefer in here than you might think. This isn't as fast-moving or as clever as the first cartoon, but it's still enjoyable, especially the standout gag where Bugs and the Mad Scientist get high off of Ether. Little Red Rodent Hood. It doesn't really do anything all that interesting compared to the other previous reimaginings of Little Red Riding Hood, and in fact, some of these gags are recycled from those previous cartoons. So that does kind of beg the question of why this one was made. Eh, it's cute enough and has a few decently funny moments, but a lot of other cartoons do these kind of retellings better. sock doodle do I could probably watch Foghorn Leghorn and the Barnyard Dog go back and forth all day. The best thing about their dynamic is that they're both evenly matched, so it makes their fights more unpredictable than your typical Looney Tunes rivalries. The inclusion of the Punching Rooster is fine, he doesn't really add a ton, but he definitely doesn't bring anything down. Another fun one that doesn't reinvent the wheel. Beep Beep Oh boy, keeping track of which gags are in which Roadrunner cartoons during my ranking is going to be a blast, I can tell. Anyway, the slapstick in this one is pretty good, like this famous Anvil on the Wire gag, although the pacing could have definitely afforded to be tightened up, especially in the mineshaft joke that just goes on too long. And yeah, the water gag should have been the final gag of the cartoon. But overall, a really good follow-up to Fast and the Furious. The Hasty Hair an incredibly funny bit of sci-fi chaos involving a fight between Bugs and Marvin the Martian. Marvin gets a lot more screen time here than in his debut, so he's given time to shine, and it's more than welcome. And it's always interesting to see Bugs in actually something resembling actual physical danger, given that Marvin is actually a threat. This one's just a blast. Ain't She Tweet. The setup for this one is just great as Tweety being surrounded by hordes and hordes of bulldogs means that the slapstick gags pretty much write themselves. This facial expression of Sylvester when he first comes across them is gold, and I also adore this brick joke. I also love this gag of the old man thinking that Sylvester has been locked outside of his yard and throws him right back to the dogs that he just escaped from. The Turntail Wolf I was initially kind of harsh on this one for being way too similar to The Trial of Mr. Wolf. And while that one is obviously better and cleverer, cleverer, more clever, this one's better than I had initially given credit for. 
This one's more focused on slapstick rather than the juxtaposition between the original work. And the slapstick is more than effective, and even has a real mean streak about itself, as it has the meanest set of Three Little Pigs that I've seen in any piece of media. Not fantastic, but definitely good and solid. Cracked Quack. An ingenious setup that's giving me Daffy Duck Hunt flashbacks. This doesn't have quite that cartoon's unbridled chaos, but this is still Daffy being his mild but still mean screwball self. And we even get to see him having a fight with a stuffed duck. Great stuff. Oily Hair. This is another Bugs cartoon where the setup of this one takes too long. But once it gets going, it is a pretty fun outing. I love how Bugs is more than willing to destroy his own home in this one just to get revenge over an oil man for trying to destroy his home. That is a level of pettiness that I can only dream of. Hoppy Go Lucky. Not one of the better Sylvester vs. Hippity Hopper cartoons, primarily because the inclusion of the cat Benny, who is supposed to be a parody of Lenny from Of Mice and Men, adds absolutely nothing to it. The fight is okay, but in all honesty, if you want to see Hippity Hopper pummel Sylvester, any of their previous outings will do the job better. This one is the prime example of a watchable cartoon. Going, going, gosh. Best Coyote and Roadrunner cartoon so far. This one is the most perfected and polished with its pacing so far, without a second of fat to trim. It's wild, it's chaotic, and the reactions of the Coyote are on point. Highlight has to be the grenade joke, mainly because the punchline was different than I was expecting, and the anticipation of the imminent explosion makes the joke so funny. A Bird in a Guilty Cage This is another Sylvester and Tweety cartoon that takes advantage of its surroundings for some good old-fashioned slapstick hijinks. It's got a few classic moments like this funny dollhouse bit. Not one of their very best, but still pretty good. Mouse Warning A rare, mild Chuck Jones cartoon of this era. I don't know why, but the slapstick just lacks punch in this one. This isn't a bad idea for a cartoon by any means, and it's watchable enough, but I also think this is the one time where going the silent route was the wrong move. I think having some funny dialogue would have gone a long way at building the comedy here. Rabbit Seasoning The second entry in Chuck Jones' hunting trilogy, and like a good sequel should, it mixes up the formula just enough so that it stands apart from the original, but not to the point where it's unrecognizable. Rabbit Fire is definitely more iconic, but this one's got some wonderful classic gags all on its own. In particular, the ending punchline, which might actually be my favorite moment in this entire trilogy, where the, would you like to shoot him now or wait till you get home joke is brought back, in which Daffy actually decides to go back with Elmer to his house to be shot. And amazingly, he even sees this as a win against Bugs, until reality smacks him across the face. The Excited Rooster This does the typical foghorn leghorn formula, and throws in a little bit of henpeck duck for good measure. Now, it's not as integrated as smoothly as it probably should have been, probably because it would have worked a lot better if Henry Hawk just straight up wasn't here, as it could have been a very successful feud cartoon between Foghorn and the dog. But still, I always enjoy watching these characters and their dynamic. Tree for Two This is like a Hippity Hopper cartoon. The premise is pretty much exactly the same, but with Sylvester on the other end for once. And that one change alone shifts the dynamic in a way that's interesting and opens itself up to a whole new set of gags. And on top of that, it's considerably meaner as the cherry on top. The Super Snooper Ah, so this is where the walk this way gag actually came from. Anyway, this is an incredibly funny parody of the typical hard-boiled detective stories, with Daffy being perfect as the clueless private eye. And by the end, we realize just how clueless he truly is. There are so many wonderful gags in here, like the search me quip, the case gag, the ball and chain gag, and the femme fatale is a great presence here as well. This is just delightful. Rabbit's Kin here is a really bizarre Bugs cartoon. And what I mean by that is that this cartoon has a new antagonist for Bugs in the form of Pete Puma, but the cartoon treats them as if they have some kind of long-standing rivalry that we're supposed to be privy to. And what makes this one unique is that, when you get down to it, this cartoon is basically telling more or less the same exact joke three separate times, but it manages to make them all different enough that they manage to elicit laughs. Shorty's voice is a little annoying, although some of his lines are actually pretty funny if you're paying attention. 
Terrier Stricken. I thought that Claude Cat's characterization from Two's a Crowd, wherein he's greedy and conniving, was a one-off, but apparently Chuck Jones was really serious about reinventing him entirely after Hubie and Birdie were written out. And to say that he doesn't feel remotely like the same cat would be an understatement. This one's alright enough as a cartoon with some decent enough slapstick, especially this really funny pull bit, albeit with pacing that's more haphazard than I would have liked, and with him going up against the incredibly annoying Frisky Dog character. Full coverage. Another one of my childhood favorites, so I'm pretty predisposed to loving this one. An excellent commentary about the parasitical nature of insurance companies that I've grown to appreciate a lot more as an adult. More wonderful chemistry between our lovable duck and pig duo. In particular, I just love how relaxed Porky is with the door-to-door -door salesman essentially just breaking in and making himself at home. And some wonderful bits of slapstick. This one is just devilishly entertaining. Although, yeah, can someone explain to me why Porky would leave a screwdriver in the oven? Is there something about older ovens that would make that plausible, or did that never make any sense? Hair Lift An oft-overlooked Bugs vs. Yosemite outing. One that I didn't even know existed, but man, is this one blast of a cartoon. Also, I adore how Bugs was more than willing to basically kamikaze himself just so he could get Yosemite Sam to say, pretty please with sugar on it. That's genuinely hilarious. Although Bugs briefly does go to outer space in this one, and yet doesn't come across Marvin the Martian. I'm pretty sure that could be seen as a Looney Tunes sin at this point. Don't give up the sheep. Gotta love the inherent laziness of just using Wally Coyote's design, but painting his nose red in order to create a whole new character in the form of Ralph Wolf. Anyway, even more of the typical Chuck Jones style chase cartoon with Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog having so much apparent chemistry from just this one outing together. Tons of fun slapstick and on-point timing, and a delightfully unexpected ending punchline. Snow Business. This one probably contains the first real instance of the truly ignorant and clueless Tweety, as he never really catches on that Sylvester is trying to eat him this time around, and he never retaliates against him. In fact, it would be fair to say that this one's more of a cartoon of Sylvester going up against a deranged, starving mouse who's trying to eat him than a proper Sylvester and Tweety cartoon. But that's not a complaint by any means, because every single element of this cartoon is focused on for as long as it should, and the gags on this one feel particularly savage and twisted. This one's been a staple of mine since I was a kid, and I still love it as an adult. A Mouse Divided for most of the runtime, this is a cartoon that strikes the perfect balance of wanton and cruelty with some cute moments, and even with a surprisingly sweet center as Sylvester goes to great lengths to protect the baby mouse after he calls him daddy, and not once even considers eating him again. The plot here feels organic, and the result is some great gags once the other cats catch wind of Sylvester raising a baby mouse. But then the bad ending knocks this one down a little bit because it doesn't make any sense. Sylvester's not knocked out here, so why doesn't he tell the stork that he's a cat and not a mouse, or the mice parents once he was delivered? It doesn't even work as a karmic ending punchline, because Sylvester had already learned his lesson, and the gag itself just isn't funny enough for it to be here. The ending punchline just straight up doesn't fit with the cartoon that preceded it. And that's not even getting into how Sylvester's wife pretty much disappears halfway through and then doesn't reappear. It's still really good in spite of that bad ending, but man, if the ending had been good, this could have gone down as one of the greats. Forward March Hare. Another one of those cartoons that could be filed under childhood favorite that I can recite from memory, despite me not understanding certain aspects of it when I was younger, like how the sergeant keeps getting demoted with every single mistake that Bugs makes. And it doesn't matter how many times I've seen this, this one still makes me laugh a lot. In particular, this gag where Bugs decides to use an ammunition shell as a freaking hammer. This one works as well as it does because it puts Bugs in a situation that, frankly, we don't see him in very often. More often than not, he's just using his wits to battle an enemy, but here he just keeps making clueless mistakes that end up making everyone else around him miserable. He's not being intentionally malicious, he's just not cut out for military life. Maybe in a roundabout way you could see this cartoon as being a commentary about how the draft is stupid because some people really truly don't belong there, 
but I highly doubt that was the filmmaker's intention. Either way, this is a treat with excellent comedic timing and features a bugs that feels like should be out of character, but weirdly isn't. Kiss Me Cat. Mark Anthony and Pussyfoot are back, and they're just as adorable as they've ever been. Every interaction between these two is just sheer and utter perfection. This doesn't quite hit the genius of their first outing, but man alive does it come close. This gag of the mouse turning Pussyfoot into a horse is fantastic, and this completely out of nowhere but still hilarious guess who gag. But I also love just how much abuse Mark Anthony is willing to take just so he won't be separated from his pal. Shows just how much he loves him. Turns out Chuck Jones can do cute just fine, he just needed the right characters in order to do it well. Duck amuck. What do you want me to say? It's a masterpiece. From top to bottom, from start to finish. It is a magnificent work of art that doubles as a surrealist postmodern piece about the fractured relationship between the author and his characters, even working in some tinges of Kafka with Daffy raging against his creator while he's helpless to do anything about it, while also being a masterfully timed, hilarious cartoon with exquisite gags and oozes chaos every single chance it gets. This is a real virtuoso and one of the greatest pieces of art ever conceived. I could go into the specifics of the gags, but let's face it, you've already seen this, and if for some reason you haven't, you really need to get on that right now. Like, right now. As in, stop this video immediately, seek it out, watch it, and then come back. It really is that wonderful. Upswept hair. You ever watch something and think, yep, this exists? That's what this one's like. This is one of those where the entire pacing and rhythm of it just doesn't really work. Now, Elmer's interactions with his neighbor are good, but the interactions between Bugs and Elmer feel bizarrely flat. A peck of trouble. Can we just agree that Dodsworth was a mistake as a character and never speak of him again? Even the slapstick timing here doesn't feel particularly polished. The ending punchline was pretty good, but nowhere near enough to justify this one's existence. Foul weather. Here's a pretty mean and twisted Sylvester and Tweety cartoon, and one of their best, too. It may have a lot of moving parts to it, like Hector the dog trying to catch Sylvester, and Sylvester having to deal with the rooster, but each part is focused on as long as it needs to. I also love how this cartoon acknowledges that roosters are essentially bigamists who have lots of mates. And of course, there's this imagined spot where we actually see Granny shooting Hector, which is so out of nowhere that it works. This one's really funny, with some great slapstick and timing. Muscle Tussle. There's a few halfway decent gags in here, but that can't really disguise the fact that this is a plot that, to be honest, I'm not all that crazy about. The plot of the tough beach guy taking the weakling's girl. Honestly, if his girlfriend Duck is just going to abandon him just because he won't get into a fight with a total stranger only because she tells him to, I don't know why we're supposed to want them to be together. Southern Fried Rabbit. This one gets bonus credits for its utterly absurd premise of a Confederate soldier who somehow is not only still alive 90 years after the Civil War, but is still at his post thinking the war is still going on. You can make an argument that this cartoon is a metaphor for the Confederate sympathizers, particularly the Southerners who purport the Lost Cause narrative, and those who hate any and every Northerner in sight and refuse to let the war go, even decades later. Like most subtext that can be derived for this cartoons, it's debatable how much of it was intentional, but again, it is in here. Anyway, the gags in this one are pretty good, like this bomb gag and this cannon gag. And yes, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, this is another cartoon that features bugs in... Okay, not exactly blackface because he doesn't have the stereotypical blackface look, but he is disguised as a slave. I can't really say this one's that offensive, namely because the basis for the joke is that Sam is so stupid that he can't see through it until Bugs starts singing Yankee Doodle Dandy. And then it segues into this gag of Bugs disguising himself as Lincoln, chastising Sam for whipping slaves, which, why would he, a Confederate soldier, care about what Lincoln thinks? Anyway, it's all so ridiculous, and I don't think it's anything worse than you could see on Family Guy. I would say the ending here is a little bit too abrupt, Although I do kind of have fun imagining what the fallout of this would be for Sam. Ant Pasted. 
Elmer Fudd decides that a bunch of ants are going to celebrate the birthday of the United States of America whether they like it or not. Just like a true red, white, and blue-blooded American. This is another cartoon with Bugs reenacting wartime iconography, but the inclusion of Elmer really helps this one stand out and give it an identity. And the gags move at a great pace. And there's... Uh, this gag... Yeah, okay, moving on. Much Ado About Nutting. How's that for a title? Especially since the original Shakespeare title is also a double entendre. Anyway, it's easy to see where Chuck Jones got inspiration for Ricky Ticky Tabby with this squirrel, who is honestly just so adorable. And he's got a fantastic design for a one-shot character. This is just a wonderful little piece. A dialogueless cartoon that tells a very simple story so effectively. It moves, it vibes, and it's cute. There ought to be a law. Feels like a throwback to those old-school Tex Avery travelogue parody cartoons from way back when, right down to having a reoccurring gag that runs throughout until you get to the payoff at the end. The gags are for the most part pretty good. Nothing spectacular, but pretty good for what it is. The gag that took me by surprise was this garage gag. I genuinely didn't see that payoff coming. Hair trimmed. This time Bugs decides to go to war for someone else out of the goodness of his heart rather than for his own individualistic purposes. And we also get the odd image of Yosemite Sam romantically chasing after Granny as she giggles like a schoolgirl. There's an image I never thought I'd see. Anyway, this is yet more Bugs vs. Yosemite Sam fighting, and honestly, those rarely miss. And this is no exception to that rule. Some really great laughs in here. Tom 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 Cat. So, it's like all those old Indian raid cartoons from before, only this time all the Indians are played by Sylvester. I don't get it. Most of these are gags that were done better from those earlier cartoons, but there's a few okay gags in here, like this fur coat gag and watching Granny and Tweety fight off Sylvester's with guns is fun to watch in and of itself. Wild Over You. This one has really stylized and beautiful looking backgrounds for some reason. And having a female cat that can actually fight back against Pepe Le Pew is a really interesting shift in this dynamic. Also, this cartoon is canon that Pepe likes it rough. Don't get mad at me, I'm just merely pointing it out. And no, I'm not reading too deeply into it. The ending where Pepe says, If you have not tried it, do not knock it, all but confirms it. There is absolutely no way that Chuck Jones and or Mike Maltese didn't know that they were alluding to masochism. And it's even more hilarious that they somehow managed to sneak it past the censors. Duck Dodgers in the 24 and a half century. Honestly, this is just another one that has just been praised to heck and back, so I don't even know what else I can add. It's just a fast-moving, hilarious bit of sci-fi cartoon chaos. Every single joke hits a bullseye, Daffy and Marvin work well together, and the pacing is just perfect. It's an absolute classic. Bully for Bugs. The back and forth between Bugs and Toro is just perfection. This is one of those cartoons that is so good that it is able to elicit laughs just from simple character movements. Also, this certainly isn't the first time this slingshot gag has been done, but this is the one that did it the best. Namely because it comes out of nowhere and the bull really couldn't do anything to stop it from coming even if he'd wanted to, which just makes the gag extra mean. The fact that this gem of a cartoon was only made because producer Edward Selzer burst into their workspace, randomly told them not to make any gags about bullfighting, and so Chuck Jones and Mike Maltese came up with this cartoon just to spite him. It's just honestly great. Plot Goes the Weasel Honestly, even by Foghorn Leghorn standards, this is really mean. I mean, he puts a bunch of baby chicks in harm's way, just to annoy the barnyard dog who's not even being that antagonistic towards him this time around. To be frank, he gets exactly what's coming to him this time around. Even the slapstick's not the best in this cartoon. It's just very mild. Cat Tales for Two. The very first appearance of Speedy Gonzalez, the fastest mouse in all of Mexico. And like I said last time, he looks absolutely nothing like his modern design. He looks a lot more like a stereotypical Mexican, with the gold tooth and everything. Yeah, this is his only appearance like this before his redesign, and honestly, that's definitely for the best. And here he goes up against two cats, Benny and George, 
who, like previously mentioned, whose personalities are taken from Benny and George from Of Mice and Men, for some reason. As for the cartoon itself, it's pretty good. Got some well-timed slapstick gags. This hammer gag here, though, is genuinely fantastic. And apart from his design, Speedy actually does make a good first impression. A street cat named Sylvester. Kind of your standard Sylvester and Tweety fare, only this time around we get to see Granny be super obsessed with vitamins and pouring some kind of green liquid down Hector's throat that's apparently supposed to be healthy for him. Also, is this ending implying that Tweety poisoned Sylvester? Because yikes is that dark. Funny, but dark. Zipping along. This gag of it pausing on the coyote smear animation is sheer genius. I also love how this pole cutting gag goes in a different direction than you might think. And of course, there's this classic gag. This is more fast moving Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner gags. Nothing more and nothing less. Lumberjack Rabbit. So here's an interesting bit of trivia. This is the only Looney Tunes cartoon that was made in 3D which was intended to be played in front of a 3D Western film that I had never heard of called The Moonlighter. Not that you can tell, because there's nothing in the actual short to indicate that this was made in 3D, other than the Warner Brothers logo at the start going too far before correcting itself to the proper position. And apparently Chuck Jones was not happy at all with how this cartoon turned out, and yeah, I don't blame him. It's not like this is terrible, but the pacing and timing of this one just feels off, and the gags in it just aren't really all that memorable, and it ends on a weak Dogs Like Trees gag. Duck, Rabbit, Duck. The final part of Chuck Jones' hunting trilogy, and the one that I think tends to get overlooked the most, which is a shame because this is still some of the tightest writing, the funniest slapstick, the most impeccable of cartoon chaos, and the pitch-perfect dynamic between these three characters. It's fantastic, and in my opinion, comes very close to topping the original. Easy peckings. I am of the opinion that if Bob McKimson is going to make a farm-based cartoon, he needs to include at least one of his staples from his Foghorn Leghorn cartoons. It's not like it's awful, it's just... there. Caddy Cornered. Here's another interesting twist on the Sylvester and Tweety formula, wherein Sylvester, in his quest to capture Tweety, winds up accidentally being seen as the hero of the picture, and he's given an opportunity to transcend his pre-established character but ultimately can't fight his true nature. Of Rice and Hen. It's a little bit of a rehash of Lovehorn Leghorn, but it still does the plot pretty well. Some more great slapstick with Foghorn vs. the Dog, and the payoff to this one is great too. Cats Away. And it's another Hippity Hopper vs. Sylvester cartoon. They really must have seen something that I'm not seeing, because this is a good idea for one, maybe two cartoons, but they quickly get repetitive. I guess they're kind of cute and occasionally amusing, but they just don't stand out, and this is no exception. Robot Rabbit. This one is the perfect amount of silly. Some really fantastic gags in here, like this one of the robot mistaking a horse for a rabbit, the gag in which Elmer and Bugs sing and dance over Bugs' apparent demise, and of course there's Bugs trying to pull off his typical seduction method, this time with a bucket on his head. Just a lot of fun. Punch Trunk. This is one of those cartoons where the entire thing is just something mundanely fantastical. In this case, a five inch tall elephant. And it's just the entire world reacting to it. Which range from standard and typical to the downright nasty and mean. The timing and the facial animation goes a long way in making this one joke cartoon work as well as it does. And I am sure you can read into the expert not accepting that the tiny elephant is real, even when it's literally right there in front of him, in whatever way you want to. Dog Pounded. This may be too much of a rehash of Ain't She Tweet, right down to including some of the same gags, but there's enough variation in this one to make it worth your while. I love it when a cartoon knows when to keep cartoon violence implied. Sometimes you don't need to see the aftermath in order to elicit a laugh out of the audience. And then, of course, there's this cameo appearance that I actually wouldn't have seen coming on my first watch through if this hadn't been included on a Pepe Le Pew DVD collection. Captain Hairblower. So it turns out Bugs has more spine put together than a bunch of hardened sailors. 
I mean, I always suspected that was the case, but it's nice to see some canon that confirmed my suspicions. Anyway, while this one doesn't stand out as much in the slew of other Bugs and Sam at Sea cartoons, this one's still got a lot of really fun canon gags, and the sheer number of ways that you can elicit funny gags from what is more or less the same basic setup is nothing if not impressive. Although this gag of Sam refusing to go down into the powder room really only works if Bugs is on the same ship right next to him, and I know that because it was recycled from Buccaneer Bunny, and it worked a lot better there. And yeah, that minor nitpick aside, this is still pretty darn good. And that is it, the ending of part 7. Again, I cannot believe just how far I've come. And as has been par for the course, this batch of cartoons was even better than the last hundred, which I attribute to Chug Jones being, for the most part, at the absolute top of his game, giving us classic cartoon after classic cartoon, sometimes even back to back. Everything during this time just felt so comfortable. Not so much to the point where it feels like they're not putting in any effort, but comfortable in that they have 100% found their footing at what works, which characters to focus on, and what will make for an all-around better product. Sure, occasionally they'll release a not-so-great cartoon, but thankfully those are the exception rather than the rule. But I also know that I have to enjoy this while it lasts because I know the cartoons can't keep improving and improving forever, and in particular, there's one era of Looney Tunes that I have been dreading since I undertook this. But thankfully, we're not there yet. But it is coming. Now, in terms of what's coming specifically for Part 8, of course, most of the staple Looney Tunes characters have been introduced by this point. So there's not really a ton of incoming new characters. Obviously, we're going to get Speedy's first appearance of what's going to be his contemporary design as well as the first proper appearances of the Tasmanian Devil, Witch Hazel, as well as the one-time appearance of the most popular one-shot Looney Tunes character of all time, Michigan J. Frog. And I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. As always, the links to parts 1 through 6 are in the description below, and if you want to be notified of when part 8 comes out, make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss it. Have a good day, and I'll see you next time.